Father God, we thank you that you are, you are our God, Lord God. And Lord, I've come this morning with some words on a piece of paper. They may or may not be relevant to what you want to say, Lord God, this morning. But I pray, Lord, that you'll take these words and that you'll send them out to wherever they need to be heard, Lord God, and that you encourage your people, that you will speak to your people. Amen. Amen. And <clears throat> before I start, I'm actually just going to reread a couple of the verses that you read from Ephesians. I'm just going to reread from Ephesians 1 and verse 11. In him, this wasn't part of what I'd got, by the way, it's just, in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purposes of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I mean, to be perfectly honest, we could just read that and go home because that says it all. But this morning we're going on a little time travel, a little whistle-stop tour of some past generations, the saints of old, indeed. And we're starting off in the book of Esther. I love the book of Esther. It's a great story, and it has a very satisfying little flavour of moral victory in there as well, which is, is lovely. I'm going to read a few chunks, but to avoid reading reams and reams and reams and whole chapters... I'll just establish a little context. Okay, so we're in the palace of King Xerxes. His queen, Queen Vashti, has greatly displeased him, and so he's ditched her, and he's sent out some attendants to basically go shopping for some attractive young girls, from whose number the king will choose a new queen. One of these young girls is Esther. Esther seems to be an orphan. She's been brought up by her cousin Mordecai. It says she has neither father nor mother, so. After, his, after Esther is taken to the king's palace, Mordecai takes to sitting at the king's gate. Presumably he wants to keep an eye on what's happening and make sure that Esther is okay. Whilst doing so, sitting at the king's gate, Mordecai hears of a plot to assassinate King Xerxes and alerts the king through Esther, the plot is uncovered, the perpetrators are hanged. Okay, with the story so far. Good. So already the king owes Mordecai a debt of gratitude. He's just saved his life. So from there, I'm going to read a couple of chunks of the book of Esther. So this is Esther chapter 3 now starting at verse 1. After these events, those events being the uncovering of the plot, etc. After these events, King Xerxes honoured Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honour higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel or pay him honour. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it, to see whether Mordecai's behaviour would be tolerated for he had told them he was a Jew. 
When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the people in all provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interests to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took off his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said, and do with these people as you please. Verse 13. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink. The city of Susa was bewildered. Chapter 4 and verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So there we are, the order to annihilate all of the Jews. And Mordecai is powerless. So Mordecai spend, sends word to Esther. Esther is in the king's palace. He sends word of Haman's intention to annihilate all of the Jewish people in the king's promises, provinces. sorry. And he asks her to plead with the king on their behalf. And we know the situation, we've read the, the story. If Esther goes before the king without being summoned, she can be put to death. Unless the king extends his golden scepter. And she knows this, and Mordecai knows this. And she says, 30 days have passed and the king has not summoned me. So Morde Mordecai responds to this with the words, this is... Um, chapter 4 and verse 14, Mordecai says, Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of the Jews will escape. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place. But you and your family and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. 
And we know the story. They fast and pray. Esther fasts and prays. Mordecai fasts and prays. All the Jewish people fast and pray for three days. And then Esther puts on her royal robes and goes before the king. And she's risking her life. But the king is pleased to see her. And he extends the golden scepter. And Esther is able to come to the king and plead for the lives of her people. There's also a rather wonderful subplot going on in this story, whereby Haman is not only utterly humiliated, but he finishes up hanging on the gallows that he has built to hang Mordecai on. So it's a great story. Read the book. But the point is, God has brought Esther to her royal position for a reason. And it's not for her to enjoy the luxury in, the, in King Xerxes' palace. It's not even for the king to enjoy Esther. God has appointed her to save the Jewish people from extermination for such a time as this. So now we're going to go on a little time travel further back in time to the Israelite nation in the desert where they've been wandering for 40 years. Okay, Moses has now died and only Joshua and Caleb remain of the generation who God brought out of Egypt. The whole nation is a new generation apart from those two men. So in chapter 1 of the book of Joshua, God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I will give you. It's as if God has been biding his time until Moses died. And now Moses has died and he said, right, now it's time to leave. So Joshua spends, send, sends two men out to spy the land, to establish a plan of action. They've got to take this land. These two men very probably would have been captured. People in the city clocked that there are spies in the land and probably killed by the king of Jericho. Had it not been for a woman who hid them on her roof and then let them down on a rope from her window so they escaped the city and were able to go and report back to Joshua. This woman, in turn, was kept safe when the city was taken. So who is this woman? Why did she help them? Why is she significant? All the Bible tells us is that her name is Rahab. She has a house in the city wall, which is how she was able to help them escape. And she is a prostitute. We can only guess at her motivation, but the one clue that we have is in verse 8 of chapter 2 of Joshua, which I don't think is on the wall. But Chapter 2 of the book of Joshua, and verse 8 says this, Before the spies lay down for the night, she, Rahab, went up onto the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites east of Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now, whatever Rahab's lifestyle was, whatever she'd been brought up to believe and whatever God she may have worshipped, she acknowledged God as God. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and in the earth 
below. So perhaps it was the case that also God appointed Rahab for such a time as this, for his purposes. Now, a little bit of a tangent. Hold on to your hats. We're okay, we'll come back in a minute. In Matthew chapter 1 appears the genealogy of Jesus. It says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, so it goes from Abraham right up to Jesus. In this genealogy, a woman named Rahab is named as the mother of Boaz. There are few women named in the genealogy. It's mostly men, so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. There are a few women named. And this woman called Rahab. Now, I don't know if this is the same Rahab or if there were dozens of Rahabs. I have no idea. But it did make me think, wouldn't it be preposterous for a prostitute to be named in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Or would it? Is there a limit to how wide God's arms can stretch? So the genealogy states that Salmon was the father of Boaz and his mother was Rahab. Now we know about Boaz going on a, another diversion here, down another story of another saint of old. The genealogy states that Salmon was the father of Boaz and his mother was Rahab. So we know about Boaz. Boaz is the relative of Naomi. Okay, so a bit of background. Naomi is married to Elimelech. There's a famine. They go off to Moab to get some food. Her husband dies. Her sons die. And Naomi is left destitute with just her daughters-in-law to help her. Are you okay? You're not lost. <laughs> so the book of Ruth follows Naomi and Ruth's journey from Moab back to her home in Bethlehem and the events that follow. So in Ruth chapter 2, we see that Boaz is a wealthy man. He has a lot of land. He makes provision for them. They, Naomi is aware that she has two living relatives left. One of them doesn't want to know. Boaz takes responsibility for these two women, ensures their safety, makes provision for them, and the rest, as they say, is history. And Ruth becomes the wife of Boaz. But hang on. Ruth is a Moabite. She's a foreigner. She's not a Jew. Doesn't Deuteronomy forbid Ammonites or Moabites from attending the assembly of the law? What's going on? That's in Deuteronomy, by the way. Nevertheless, God has chosen Ruth to be married to Boaz, grafted in. What for? For such a time as this, to be the mother of Obed, who is the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. Look again at the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And it's in the end of the book of Ruth as well. The very last few verses. When Ruth produces this son, they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And it gives you the same little genealogy there. A link in the lineage of the Messiah who would be descended from King David. A couple of verses from Isaiah, which also I didn't put up there, sorry. But from Isaiah chapter 11, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch to bear fruit. 
The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Who is he, this king of glory? There are five women mentioned in the genealogy in the first chapter of Matthew. One is not specifically named, but only referred to as the wife of Uriah. I think we can work out who that is. The others are named as Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Mary. So, if I'm not making you dizzy with this whistle-stop tour of patriarchs, we're going to go right back to Genesis, where we have Jacob and his twelve sons, from whom were to come the twelve tribes of Israel. One of these twelve sons is Judah, from whom will come the tribe of Judah. And also spoken about in Revelation 5 is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we get an inkling that Judah and his descendants are important. So Judah marries a Canaanite woman called Shua, and she has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. I always think when I read this that they were stuck for a name with the first one. What's his name? Ur. (laughs) Okay, write that down. So when Ur becomes an adult, (laughs) Judah (laughs) Judah selects a wife for his eldest son, a young girl called Tamar. And like Esther, Tamar probably had no say in the matter. She was simply told and did as she was told she's selected and so she is married but Genesis 38 tells us that Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord put him to death so Tamar is now a widow so she's married off to the second son Onan but but Genesis says that he also was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord put him to death What to do now? Judah's got one son left. And it's not looking good. And Judah doesn't feel like risking his one remaining son. So he tells Tamar that Sheila is too young to marry and that she should go home to her father's house until he's old enough and then he will send for her. A promise he has absolutely no intention of keeping. But if Sheila doesn't marry and have children, then Judah has no descendants. Where is the tribe of Judah? And Tamar has nothing at all. No husband, no child, no status, no livelihood. So Tamar disguises herself, dresses as a temple prostitute, and tricks Judah into sleeping with her and produces twin sons, Perez and Zerah. What kind of ungodly behaviour is this now? (laughs) But there they are in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a man with no integrity and a girl who tricked him. Let me just find it. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and so it goes down the genealogy. This challenges so many of my cultural perceptions of what is right and proper (laughs) behaviour, and how we think God should do things. What on earth is God doing? What he's doing is he's placing people where he needs them to be for such a time as this. Whatever the situation, we see through scripture again and again and again, just as God took the chaos right back in the very beginning when the earth was without form and darkness covered the surface of the deep and God spoke order. And God continues to speak order when mankind persists in causing chaos and destruction. 
God places those he will use where he needs them to be for such a time as this. And many, many generations later, many, many generations after Tamar and Judah, God spoke to another young woman, an ordinary girl betrothed to an ordinary man, sending an angel to speak to her, and God tells her that she is to be the mother of the Messiah, who has been prophesied all the way down the generations, that he has chosen her for such a time as this, to complete the line, to facilitate the most momentous event in the history of the world, where God embraces not only the Jews and the Moabites, but also the prostitutes, the incompetent, the dishonest, and all of the Gentiles. And the young girl responds by saying, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. When God places us somewhere, we're often not sure why. We look at the situation and think, what am I doing here? And maybe we'll never see the big picture. I don't suppose that Tamar did. I don't suppose she had any idea that she would be named in the genealogy of Jesus Christ the Messiah. How many times have I looked at what's going on? Not just in my life, but in the world. I mean, the world is a mess. It really is. And say, God, you're doing it wrong. How many times do we feel like saying, God, you are doing it wrong. What are you doing? But if God has placed us somewhere, all we really need to do is respond as Mary did and say, may it be to me as you have said. Not that that is an easy thing, it's not an easy thing, but it's rather it's not a complicated thing. To do the work that is in front of us, to care for the people next to us, because who knows that we have been brought to this place for such a time as this. The end. So I didn't have a closing song. Um, 